Tick tock, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to all the Christians, the Jews, the Muslims, the atheists, the agnostics, the Hindus, the Buddhists, and yes, even you Rastafarians who are watching all around the world. I am your friendly neighborhood philosopher, David Wood, and with me right now is the author, the ex Muslim, uh, the founder of the Atheist Republic, Armin Navabi. And we're going to be having an interesting discussion here on my channel. I'm going to be interested, uh, interviewing him about his story, his background. And then on Sunday, we'll be on his channel having a discussion about atheism, Islam, and Christianity. So, Armin, how are you doing? Good, good. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I saw you a while back when you were uh, being deplatformed. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a little bit about that. Um, yeah, I was I was supposed to speak in a Mont Montreal University in Calgary about uh, Islamic reform, which I was basically gonna was about to argue against. Uh, but the New Zealand attacks happened, and they decided that this is not a topic that they want to have um, right after an attack on Muslims like that. So they canceled the event, even though I mean they told us last minute like. We, everything was planned uh, um, people were going to come so they cancelled the event which I think uh, it was ridiculous to be fair to them they, the university president later on himself came out and said that that was the wrong decision uh, and there was a, there's now an open invitation for me to come back um, and also the cancellation of the event actually got a lot of it, it always backfires because it got mm. so much press coverage that I a lot of people were introduced to me and the work that I do so um, but I mean, it, it's obvious that it's ridiculous because imagine if, um, you know, if, if, if I, I don't think if the university had an imam or an Islamic scholar coming to speak, and if there was an Islamic terror attack somewhere, they would be canceling the event. They would be like, this is mm -hmm. not the right time for you to come talk about Islam, given that we just had an Islamic terror attack. Like mm -hmm. that sounds ridiculous, right? Yeah. Um, so it's, I mean, it's pretty biased, pretty mm -hmm. unfair. Yeah, uh, and, uh, and as and, you know, as you pointed out, that you know, uh, shortly after the um, the attack in New Zealand, there was the attack in Sri Lanka. I don't recall people being banned from criticizing Christianity after that, or or after any of the the terrorist attacks against Christians over the, over the years. Uh, but when it's Muslims, somehow uh, a switch goes off in. Um, in people's brains. But yeah, I find that very, very disturbing. And, and mainly it's because, you know, if people wanted to deplatform me for something, if people wanted to say David Wood shut up about Islam for a while because mm -hmm. this, this, you know, whatever it was happened, uh, that would be one thing. But when it's an, when it's an ex-Muslim, when it's an ex-Muslim, someone who is officially under a death sentence from Islam, uh, to tell an ex-Muslim, hey, you have to be quiet here. You you need to you need to shut up about this religion that is growing rapidly and calls for your violent death. Uh, it's always disturbing. It was like I mean, it reminds me of like back when my my best friend from college, Nabil Qureshi, became uh, left Islam and became a Christian. And I, I, when I would say something about Islam, people would, hey, you 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 you're being a bigot. You're being an Islamophobe. And it's always in my mind. Wait a minute. There, there's this ideology out here that calls for the the beheading of my best friend, and you're telling me to shut up about it. What, what kind of coward would I be if I shut up about something that calls for the, the violent death of my best friend? Right. And, and to be fair, you don't have to be an ex-Muslim to be able to criticize Islam mm -hmm. uh, or, or anything to be uh, mm -hmm. any religion or any ideology, Christianity, mm -hmm. atheism, Judaism, you could criticize it. I mean, um, I, I don't want us to use our ex-Muslim card as a license to criticize Islam. <laughs> like a lot of people are like, oh, you're ex-Muslim or you're from Iran. So you should like these white people shouldn't be able to talk about Islam. But you you have a license to talk about Islam. No, no, that's n nonsense. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think it's pretty it's pretty easy to see if an ideology like to to be fair for me to with i criticize all religions and i'm against all religions mm -hmm. and i know a lot of your audience doesn't like that but that's how it is um and i'm very outspoken against both islam and christianity judaism hinduism buddhism an atheist republic we go after them all i do admit though that uh, islam is the worst uh, mo worst living religion there were there are worse religions than islam but they are dead now um but 
yeah, but I, I don't like I don't want people to say like, oh, you're ex-Muslim, so you know I can't believe they cancel you. They shouldn't cancel anybody. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't matter if you're ex-Muslim or not. Like, and I, and I also want to emphasize that I don't think it goes against uh, my free speech for the university to deplatform me unless it's a public university and it's publicly funded. Um, because I don't think that you we do have a right to speech, but we don't have a right to a platform. I just think it's bad policy. Just because it doesn't go against my free speech, I don't think it's a good idea. Not everything has to be against free speech for it to be a bad idea. It's still a bad policy, even if it doesn't violate my free speech. Mm-hmm. No, and, and and I would agree. Um, we uh, we're we're all for uh, saying whatever you think and criticizing anything you disagree with. Here, it's kind of a it's kind of a situation where. If you're going to block speech from from anybody, like even because there are, there are plenty of groups out there that want to uh, silence people, silence critics of various ideologies, it, ju- it just seems like the last people you should ever try to silence or try to deplatform would be someone whose life is on the line be- because of that. Um, so uh, anyway. Um, all right. So I uh, wanted to answer one comment here because it looks like it's from a Muslim. This one's directed towards me. And then I'm going to have we'll we'll get into some questions. By but by the way, everyone, this warrior woman here uh, put here, uh, smash that like button, wage jihad on that like button, behead that <laughs> like button, um, and come up with all the creative ways you can say in the chat of uh, smashing that like button. Uh, Wahid here says uh, X17 apologetics. I saw your debate with Shabir Ali. You said you don't condemn Muhammad for conquering, even though you criticize him for that. Why do you say that? Uh, well, I think you misunderstood me. Um, what I what I normally point out is when I criticize uh, Muhammad uh, and and jihad and so on, I'm not saying that Muhammad taught to wage jihad, therefore Islam is false. Um, when I say that Muhammad ordered his followers to wage jihad and violently subjugate the world and so on, I'm saying that because people say that Islam doesn't command that, and they say that it has nothing to do with terrorist attacks. So I'm correcting someone. As far as I'm concerned. If that were from God, then that would just be that would just be what what God is commanding him to do. Um, so I don't believe that Ma, that Allah commanded Muhammad to do that. I don't believe that God commanded him to do that. But my reasons for rejecting Islam are other reasons. So uh, right. so ju- just to be just to be clear on that. Hope that clarifies things, Wahid. But we can talk if, if I'm still not clear. We can talk about that another time. We are here. Just, oh, go just ahead. So I, I just want to add something about Muhammad. A lot of people. Like more and more uh, research and data is coming out, and everything we think we thought we know about Muhammad could be completely, you know, made up. Because especially in the ex-Muslim community, we keep on talking about how Muhammad was a, like a warlord, was barbaric, was this, was that. But the more the more we study it, the more we realize that you know none of the hadiths or the bi- all the biography of Muhammad they were all written 200 years after his alleged date of death and to be honest there is no evidence really we don't know how much of that is accurate like mm-hmm. we don't know if any of it actually reflects uh, muhammad at all like th- so when we are criticizing muhammad we are criticizing a character that 99 percent of what we know about everything he said and done could be fiction Right, but mm-hmm. you can still do that about a fictional character, just like you could mm-hmm. do that about Voldemort. Right, mm-hmm. you could you be like Voldemort is evil, right? Mm-hmm. And you could be like Muhammad, as described in Islam, did some terrible things. Mm-hmm. We don't know if it, we don't know if there is any his, histor, like historical evidence for for somebody doing any of that. But that character, as described in these books, in in Sahih Bukhari and the Quran. It seems pretty barbaric by modern standards. Yeah, and I, I actually, uh, <clears throat> Robert Spencer has a book called Did Muhammad Exist? And uh, I actually had a debate with Robert Spencer on whether Muhammad existed because I'm someone who, who grants the general timeline of Muhammad's life and the, and the general events and so on. But uh, when you have to actually defend it, it is very hard to to defend um, knowing much of anything about Muhammad's life. I did. I, I, did the, I did the best I could. I actually argued based on the principle of embarrassment, the principle that that historians use and, and and lawyers and so on use it as well. Basically, if you admit something that's embarrassing, you're probably not making it up because why would you? If you're making it up, you wouldn't invent something that's that's uh, embarrassing to your case. So uh, so I actually built. I actually basically said, 
hey, if uh, if Muslims were making this up, then why did they make up all of this stuff about Muhammad delivering revelations from Satan and and things like that? So, but it, it's a it's a rough case because, as, as you pointed out, for the you know. In, Muhammad supposedly going around conquering Arabia, and yet, as far as historians are concerned, no one ever heard of this guy. No one ever heard of his city. No one ever heard of anything he's doing back in back in that time. Right, but when you make stuff up, it's not like you make stuff up out of scratch. You ha you work with already stories that are going around about you know you have to pick and choose. Like mm -hmm. you know, like it's the politics on behind. So f a lot of the things that you find embarrassing today even 200 years after his alleged death might have not been considered embarrassing mm -hmm. at that time. It might mm -hmm. have been normal or not mm -hmm. embarrassing, right? And a lot of the things that were inconvenient for the plot might have been stuff that were just already circulating and would have been hard to get rid of. Like it's the, you know, the and there's a lot of other, like it's not like you're, you're not dealing with an empty sheet of paper and just somebody starting writing down, right? There's a lot of politics, there's a lot of agenda about which hadith makes it in, which hadith doesn't make it in. Um, so those, those embarrassing mm -hmm. plot holes could be ex explained mm -hmm. like that. But anyways, we're getting into the yeah. theology too much. Yeah. And, and, and by, by the way, that, that was, uh, that was Robert's argument. Um, so I had to, um, I had to reply to that, that basically there are things that we even knew were, were embarrassing in the early Muslim community. But that, anyway, the point, the point of all that is, is normally if you're, if you're defending something historical, historical, mm -hmm. you look for early sources. We don't have that. Um, historians look for multiple sources, right? Like not just one person saying something. If you have multiple sources all reporting the same thing, that's right. considered stronger. We don't have that with Islam, not until not until a long time after. Uh, they look for multiple independent sources, so uh, sources right. that aren't, aren't all copying the same source. It's basically all of the main things that historians look for when they try to figure out what happened historically. Uh, you right. don't have that with Islam. You just got this big gaping hole of this guy who's supposedly going around conquering Arabia. He's challenging the Persians. He's challenging the Romans. And you go to the Persians and the Romans and no one's ever heard of this guy. So, so right. it, it, it is a, it is a problem. And that's why you kind of have to have to uh, rely on secondary principles, but it's not the strongest case. So to be fair, if you read books, like uh, if you study the Bible, like the way Bart Ehrman studies the Bible, I know people here disagree. There are some problems with history coming from Christianity as well, but when I don't want to get into Christianity, I know a lot of people from, you know, atheist Republic expect me to go into Christianity, but just, just to be clear, we we are continuing this discussion on, on the Atheist Republic YouTube channel uh, on Sunday. And if anybody's watching and wondering why we're not going to go into Christianity, is because we're doing that on Sunday, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the only reason why I'm not going to touch it that much, right? Yep. So yeah. So 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 right. Yeah. So right now, guys, um, and it's a good time to jump into it. Um, basically, wanted uh, Armin to. Uh, share with us about uh, his life and why he decided to leave Islam and become an atheist as far as actually get into a discussion about, you know, atheism and, and Christianity and criticisms of these of these views. Uh, yeah, we'll be doing that on his channel on Sunday. So if that's what you're looking for, be sure to tune in to the Atheist Republic. The link is in the description box to that to that uh, to that channel. So you, so uh, you'll, you'll be able to find it there. All right. So uh, so Armin. Um, yep. Story time. Yep. Let's get well. For, well, first, first, uh, first. Why don't we? Why don't we start with sort of uh, what you're doing now, and then we can, and then we could go back to the beginning. So, what what is your your organization, Atheist Republic? Why don't you tell people a little bit about that and what you do? Yeah, Atheist Republic is the world's la largest atheist group with more than two million uh, followers worldwide. Um, um, and the reason, well, the main reason why I started it was purely for selfish reasons because when I became an atheist I was still in Iran and I was very lonely I, f I didn't know any other atheists I felt very isolated so I made an online community just to see if I could find other atheists um, and mm -hmm. when I did so it just grew um, so fast and I, it was unbelievable and and it, for us it was um, so so amazing to be able to find other people that are like us. It just felt like we found a f family like we didn't know that we had. And, and especially all the people that kept on joining, the most common thing that we kept on hearing was like, I didn't know there's so many other atheists around the world. Um, and for us to be able to bond like that online was our escape, our way to be able to express ourselves, especially uh, people living in countries or in communities or in families where they are not able to express them so so freely, right? 
So it just kept on growing, growing and growing, and then it turned into the uh, world's largest atheist community. But uh, the main, so we do, we we do <coughs> a lot of anti-religion posts and attacks and all of that on Atheist Republic. But even though that's a lot of a lot of what we do, that's not the main goal. The main goal is to provide a community for people that are already atheists, right? The re- the all these posts that we make about religion is for people to find us and come and know that we are out there, right? So going after religion is secondary. The main goal is to provide a place for atheists to know that there is a lot of us, to know that they don't have to feel alone, to know that they don't have to feel isolated. We don't. Uh, we used to be just an online community, but now we have consulates in m- most major cities around the world where people could meet offline uh face to face just to see that there's a alternative community for them other than religious community we say religion doesn't have a monopoly over community if you lose your religious community there's an alternative for you uh we got into trouble for that actually in in malaysia and kuala lumpur uh, our uh, atheist republic consulate was discovered by muslims and then eventually by the government where the deputy minister declared that we need to hunt down these atheists uh, and eventually that was brought up um, our atheist republic consulate in kuala lumpur's case was picked up by humanist international and was brought to the uh, human rights council in the united nations uh, so and that was the first time actually atheism was mentioned in the you know in the united nations um so that was that was a big thing. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, think about it. Athe- they said the, the deputy minister said atheists need to be hunted down. Um, and it, did, it, did, it got some coverage thanks to people like Richard Dawkins, Matt Delante, and some other people. But it didn't get that much coverage. I think, and this is why I think like we need an atheist advocacy group. Because when, when people go after Christians, Muslims, mm-hmm. Jews, and Hindus, there's a giant community of Christians, <coughs> Jews, and uh, Hindus that um, and Muslims that that are speaking out for them, right? So, for example, if Christians are attacked in Egypt, churches all around the world will be talking about it. If a Muslim is attacked, I don't know somewhere, in uh, Muslims are attacked in New Zealand, there's a whole community of Muslims around the world bringing up this in their mosque, trying to raise money, trying to get support, trying to push back against government. Jews as well, Hindus as well. We don't have that advocacy group right now for atheists around the world. And that's what Atheist Republic is trying to become. Mm. Right. <coughs> All right, everyone. Uh, for those of you who didn't see yesterday, I'm uh, getting over a case of strep throat here. So um already reached the limits of my talking ability so armin is going to be doing most of the talking right now i i did want to point out though um even for you christians right even for your christians and uh anyone else out there who aren't atheist and you're not crazy about atheists and so on um and you're obviously not going to agree with the, the criticisms of religion and so on uh you should still find it important um what they're doing in the world right now because if you ever want religious freedom in places like saudi arabia and pakistan and so on if you ever want people to be safe and to have freedom of religion and freedom of choice and freedom of conscience in these places without living in fear because they're not muslims if you ever want that you need enough people in these countries to raise this issue to where the government finally eventually has to step in and say look we have enough we have enough diversity here that we need to put laws in place that protects all of these people and so even even if you're just thinking from a christian perspective and something like that you should still say okay well it, it's good that that atheists are having a community there because this might eventually lead to um, laws protecting religious freedom in some of these places, and uh, right. actually, that's a very good point because we are the we are the worst of the worst. Like, right? like there's atheists are their mere existence is punishable by death in 13 countries. Right? Even in North America, atheists are seen as the least trustworthy uh, people, group. Of, like the the amount of we we are looked down upon all around the world. So if if we if we manage to get tolerance, it's good for everybody 
because since we're at the bottom of the list mm-hmm. of the people mm-hmm. that are tolerated, if we are tolerated, everyone else is probably also tolerated. No, that, that's, so, that's a good point. So, so guys, you know, it is, as much as Christians are disliked in a lot of these places, atheists are disliked more. So if we ever get to the point where atheists are safe in these countries, you know Christians right. are, are going to be doing uh, going to be doing pretty well. And, uh, and guys, we, you can understand the perspective there because if you remember some of these situations uh, with people like, you know, Rife Badawi, and so on, where you start talking about atheism, you might you might find yourself in jail or or worse. Mm. So it makes sense that you can't you can't exactly go around looking for atheists. Hey, any atheists out there? I'm trying to form a group at my school, <laughs> and so you know right. people people can't do that in some of those places. And so it makes sense that they would go online and start looking uh, online for a for a community to uh, to support them. All right, right, so so thank you for that. Now, why don't you go ahead and, and go back into your background? Uh, first of all, before right before, oh, just one thing, one thing before I do that, you know, I I tell people you don't have to be an atheist to be part of the atheist movement, because you could be a Christian, and a, or a Muslim, but think that it's unfair for people to be oppressed, discriminated against, punished, imprisoned. If you think. Mm. Uh, just for being an atheist. If you speak for atheists' right to be able to express themselves, even if you're not an atheist, you're part of the atheist movement. And you could be an atheist that is not part of the atheist movement. You could be an atheist that doesn't care. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, I don't believe in God, but who cares? I'm not going to bother, waste my time with other people's lives. I I have only myself to care about, right? Mm -hmm. So being part of the atheist movement is separate from being an atheist. Christians and Muslims could be part of the atheist movement. Atheists, some atheists could be not part of the atheist movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. right, So, so so, uh, background, what was, uh, what were things like when you're growing up? Uh, Give us a little bit of your, your, your background. Right. So I was born and raised in Iran. Um, I grew up in, at my my parents were extremely liberal um, and secular and anti mm-hmm. anti religious. Um, so they were more liberal than people I he- know here today in Canada. Mm-hmm. Like they, it was weird how uh, liberal they are. But um, when I but I became extremely religious, even though I grew up in a very liberal family. Um, but that was later on in during my teen years. But before that happened, I remember as a child, I was very, uh, I, I couldn't understand the idea of hell. I, we were, we were all, they told, I, went, I remember the first time I t- learned about the idea of hell and there's this being a place where people could burn forever and be punished. I, I, as I, this was before elementary school. I, I remember crying about it. And, uh, I remember my aunt asking me, finding me crying and asking me why I'm crying. And I told her that I'm worried I'm going to go to hell. And this is like six or seven years old, right? And she told me, like, don't worry about it, Armin. Only the worst people will go to hell, the murderers, the rapists. You don't have anything to worry about. And that calmed me down for a while until I went to... Uh, school and in school they told us actually no most people are going to go to hell not only most non-muslims are going to go to hell even most muslims are also going to go end up in hell especially right? women per- especially women especially they didn't tell us that that's something no. you learn when you become an ex-muslim <laughs> uh, but um, every sin has to be paid for right and even the smallest sins have to be paid for so you could be a muslim but if you sin you still go to hell and you have to pay for it before you eventually graduate to heaven like the smallest sins could get you thousands of years in hell, um, and I. So and I looked at my parents, especially. I remember my parents uh, drinking. Not my parents never fasted. Uh, they never prayed. They only saw inside of a mosque when it was when somebody died or somebody was getting married. Um, so and I and my school was telling me that they're going to have to pay for it in hell. Um, and I, you know, I tried to, I went to our religion teacher and I, they told us that, you know, you could, people that missed their prayers or missed the days that they supposed to fast during Ramadan and they didn't, you could actually pray it for them yourselves and basically do it for them 
after they die or something. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know what? When my parents die, I'm going to do my prayers, my fasting, but I also do my fasting, their fasting and prayers for them. By the way, a lot of Sunni Muslims will get really angry every time I talk about this because they're like, oh, that's not Islam. Or, yes, oh, okay, yes. That's, 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 no, I mean, that's what I learned in <laughs> Iran, okay? <laughs> and I know and I understand that there's different versions of how <laughs> this is, this is told to people. This is the Iranian education system. I'm not telling you you guys that this is your version, okay? I'm just telling you this is what we learn in Iran. So the teacher basically started calculating how many days my parents... He asked me how old my parents are. When do you think they were going to die? So he added up all the days that they didn't pray, all the days that didn't fast. And he basically added them all up, and he counted the hours of time that I need to pray for the missing prayers. And he told, he showed me that it's humanly impossible. And there are all the days that I'm supposed to fast. Like, okay, what if I hire people to do their prayers and fast? Because I was trying to get them out of hell, my parents out of hell. And you're like, okay, let's say you pay people this much. Uh, this is how much money you have to raise to be able to get people to pray for your pray the missing prayers of your um, parents and the fasting that they didn't do during Ramadan. So you're like, okay, so you have to become very, very rich. Other, other, other than that, they're going to go to hell. So ex imagine, like, I'm a little kid and my my we're doing math on paper and my my teacher is trying to prove to me that you can't save your parents from hell. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. And this is extremely traumatizing to me. It's math but, it's mathematically impossible for you to <laughs> save your parents from hell. From exactly. Hell. Okay. I actually <clears throat> let me I have a burn mark here and this is me testing how much it hurts to burn. I actually uh, put it, lit it and put it on my skin just to just to feel how much it hurts to 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 be burned and then I try to imagine it for 10 minutes then I try to imagine it for for a couple of years and then I try to imagine it for thousands of years and then for eternity and and I said like there's no way anybody could tolerate even a second of the, even minutes of this like how could this be a punishment for anything um but here but then I, I found this is when things got really weird. I found a loophole in the system, okay? And this is two different things that we learned from two separate, uh, you know, completely unrelated topics. But I just put them together and I found it. I thought I found a loophole in the system. Uh, they told us that they, they, uh, in Islam, they t this, is, this part is for all of Islam, but I tell you which one is specific to what we learned. So you know how in Christianity you're born with sin, right? So in Islam, that's that's not the case. Like they, I'm only compared to Christianity <clears throat> because um, not because I knew about Christianity then, but now I compare it, right? But uh, in in Islam, they uh, they tell you that it's not logical for you to ha sin before reaching maturity, right? You have to reach a certain age before you could be held responsible for your actions. Right, so children are considered completely pure, one hundred percent sinless. Ma'asum, they call it, right? Uh, and you hit once you hit the age of reason, then your sins and your good deeds start counting. They told us that you have you have two angels, one on your right shoulder and one on your left shoulder, and the one on your right shoulder is writing all your good deeds, and the one on your left shoulder is writing down all your sins. Um, and but be, but their sheet is completely white clean before age of reason, right? In Iran, they told us that the age of reason for girls is nine, and for boys that age is fifteen. Um, again, this this is the part that is different because for other Muslims, they they say no, there's no specific age. Uh, there's it's just when you hit maturity, it's different from other different people. But in Iran, they had specific numbers. Uh, 9 and 15 and many years later I realized why they picked 9 and 15 because those are also the ages of marriage right so they they logically thought like you cannot be married unless you uh, hit the age of reason so they picked 9 and 15, 9 for girls 15 for boys um, so to me, to me that meant that there is no way for me to sin before age 15 right because I can't be held responsible for my actions my sheet is completely cl clean Suicide is a sin in Islam, but there is no sin before age 15. So suicide cannot be a sin if I commit it before age 15. What happens if I die before age 15? 
if you die and you have committed no sins, there's only one destination, heaven. So if I wait to hit age 15, there's, there's two destinations for me, heaven or hell. But if I die before age 15, the only place I could end up in is heaven. So I thought, why wouldn't I just kill myself and make sure I go to heaven? It's not a sin if I do it before age 15. I went to my religion teacher and asked him, why wouldn't I just kill myself and make sure I go to heaven? And he said that, well, because you get the lowest part of heaven. Apparently, heaven has different layers. The top part is for martyrs, and that's where Muhammad is. <clears throat> the lowest part is would be for people that died just because they died as a child. Like he said, if you don't earn heaven, you just go to the lowest part of heaven. And I thought to myself, I don't, I don't give up. You know what? But I don't care. I, I, I'll take a parking lot for eternity. I just don't want to go to hell. If this is the only reason, then I should take the option. Why would I gamble potentially going to hell if I could get guaranteed heaven? So I jumped out of the window of my school. Uh, I broke my left hand. I broke both my legs. I fractured my back, almost cut my spine. I was in a wheelchair for seven months, wheelchair in my bed. Uh, I missed one year of school. And the only reason why I didn't try it again um, was because I saw what it did to my parents. Mm -hmm. I saw my, my dad cry for the first time. I didn't know my dad is capable of crying. I saw my mom come to the hospital and she just collapsed on the ground crying. I, and I felt very selfish because I was thinking about myself and I didn't, um, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't considering what I'm doing to them. And I did, I didn't try it again, but honestly, if I, if back then I could see myself now, because this becoming an, I, I knew that I can't guarantee heaven because I didn't know what, what kind of a person I was, would become. Um, and if I knew I was going to become an atheist, I would have tried it a thousand more times because this, what I am today, was my greatest fear back then as a Muslim. <clears throat> so when I became, when I, when I became, when I reached age 15, um, I decided that, okay, there's a uh, game over. There's no way I could commit suicide anymore because suicide, everything is a sin now, including suicide. So you missed your uh, chance. I missed my chance when the window by, by the way, how, how old were you when you uh, attempted suicide? I think I was around 14, mm -hmm. according to my dad. Mm -hmm. 14 or 13, 13 or 14. Uh, this was first year guidance school in, in Shiraz, Iran. Mm -hmm. So that would make me around 13, I think. Yes, 13. I'm, I'm, uh, uh, yeah, between 13 and 14. Um, but... Um, so when I reached age 15, um, I became, I, I told myself, you know, this can't be that hard, right? Um, I'm a, I just have to make sure I don't miss any prayers. Um, I fast during Ramadan. Don't sin. How hard could this be? Right? Like, let's, I, but honestly, I still felt it was very unfair, like, because it seemed like I was playing a game that the consequences of losing was so high that nobody should be asked to play this game without their consent like somebody should have asked us before before god creating us there should have been like there should be a agreement at the beginning like okay this is the this is the you know this is the price you pay if you lose do you want to enter and i would be like no don't create me this is like why would i you know anyways but given that um i was stuck now um, I started became very observant. I started praying and fasting, but what I didn't take into account is how hard it is to stay away from sinning, especially for a teenage boy discovering that he's attracted to the opposite sex more and more every year going by. And the problem with God is that he's not just, a t at least in Islam, is that he's not just a tyrant of your actions. He's also a tyrant of your thoughts. So you could be doing nothing and you're just sinning by having the wrong thoughts. Um, and you constantly, your mind goes in places where it's not supposed to go. And you're constantly asking for forgiveness. I keep feeling it so embarrassed. I feel thinking like I betrayed my God. I 
begged him for forgiveness. Mm. I kept on asking him that would never uh, telling him it would never happen again, and it will keep happening. I mean, it's a teenage. You're, but I, I also also now when I think about it, I mean that was I think it was. Um, at least you know that one day you're gonna get married and everything will be fine. But imagine if I was gay, then I would be ashamed of my feelings, and I would know that I have never. This is how I'm gonna be forever, which is even more difficult for gay people in Islamic countries and almost everywhere else, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but once something that I couldn't shake, uh, couldn't understand was. All the non-Muslims going to hell, like the Christians, the Hindus, the Jews, the everybody was gonna go. To, like at least the Muslims would that sinning, they might go to hell for like a few years or thousands of years, but eventually they would go to heaven. But like they, t- all non-Muslims are supposed to go to hell forever. There's and never get out. And to me, that just seems so unfair. I couldn't like the the amount of injustice in that. I couldn't shake that off. I didn't want to doubt because I know God could see what I'm thinking, but it it just kept on staying there. And I thought to myself that you know what? Maybe, maybe everybody is a little bit Muslim. <laughs> maybe all these other religions are um, Muslim light, mm-hmm. right? So maybe they're kind of all the same a little bit, and that's why they're not going to go to hell because. I couldn't accept that this is this is going to be all these you know billions of people's fate, right? So I went to the library and I picked up a book about the history of religion, and just to see what these other religions are about. And the book was completely different from what I expected. But the more I read it, I mean, it started with cavemen and how the earliest religion in history, where people, you know, that we have evidence for where people like put decorations around the people that died or put gifts for their dead ones like that's how it you know and then it kept on evolving and then then went to ancient egypt and other places and the more i studied it the more it seemed like the more it seemed like this is all this all seems made up like this all just seems like religion is like evolving uh, through history like people are just copying each other they're taking their local stories and they're just mixing it with religions of other people and based on the political needs at the time coming up with new religions and then at some point i was like wait a minute what if my religion is made up mm-hmm. and i like why and then i was so surprised that i never i never thought about it and like mm-hmm. i tried to think about when was the time that i accepted my religion and i couldn't remember i just like wait i just we just accepted that this is the truth. Like I never questioned it, and I actually felt embarrassed that I never even questioned it. But then when I when I kept on thinking more and more that this all seems made up, I also felt pretty arrogant because I didn't know anybody that thought any of this was made up. Like nobody around me thought this. So if I said that this seems made up, basically what I was claiming was that I have discovered something that nobody that I know of have discovered. Nobody that at least in my, like, I like I knew people that were doctors, professors, educated people. They were all Muslim. My parents, all my friends. And I'm claiming that I discovered this conspiracy, this con, and, I'm, and I figured it out and they're all duped. Um, so I felt like maybe, maybe I'm just insane. Maybe they all know some, they're seeing something that I'm not seeing, and maybe there's just something wrong with my head. So I told my first, you know, the first time I told my, uh, my friends, my close friends, I just told them, like, look, I think this is all made up. And I explained to them why I think it's made up. And within weeks, they started to think this is made up. And because they were convinced by what I was saying, I thought, like, maybe I'm onto something. Maybe I'm not going crazy. And that's when I started an online community just to see if there are other people that think like me. And hundreds of people joined very fast. And we were also surprised about how many of us are out there. And we were like, okay, maybe we're onto something here, like mm-hmm. you know, more of us. So, yeah, that's that's my story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, uh, right before we started, you and I were talking briefly. I mentioned that 
um, <clears throat> back in 2005, 2006, when I started um, interacting with lots of Muslims and so on, that it was uh, it was rare to have um, ex-Muslims speaking out and talking about Islam. And there were, there were so few that whenever someone would say, would claim to be a former Muslim, um, he would be kind of shouted down as a fake ex-Muslim, right? They would say, no, you're, you're actually a Jew. You're, you're being paid by Jews to pretend that you're a, a fake ex-Muslim. Whereas uh, now, I mean, it seems like every day, every, every day we see more, uh, <clears throat> more ex-Muslims speaking out. So um, right. what, what, what's that like seeing that? Because if you think about it, I mean, if, if we're talking about, you know, 2005, 2006, it was pretty rare to find ex-Muslims. And now they're kind of all over the place. We're kind of at the beginning. We're kind of at the beginning of a, of a transition here. So we're seeing kind of an explosion in of, of, of people leaving Islam. What's that like for you? I mean, for me, it was, it, it looked like impossible like i could not imagine that we would get to this this outspoke this huge like the explosive community is now larger and more connected than ever that i could have ever imagined happening when i was growing up in iran we were told that you know if anybody just reads the quran they will just become muslim that's mm -hmm. all it takes and nobody would underwrite like Obviously, when you're a Muslim, you will never consider leaving it because mm -hmm. it just everything just makes complete sense. Um, and the Quran is the most beautiful thing written. You just have to mm -hmm. hear it. Even demons, jinns, when the first time they heard the Quran, Muhammad, they just became Muslim. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, so we, were, you know, but then when it, even when we be, left Islam, the, we met a lot other ex-Muslims, but we didn't think that we would ever be having openly telling the world that we're ex-Muslim. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like we felt like, oh, we have secret ex-Muslim, former Muslim atheist groups, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we just, you know, kept on sh sh showing verses of Quran with each other and laughing at like how ridiculous this is and how we, how do we never see this in the Quran? Because you have to understand in Iran when we learn about the Quran and you don't, you don't read the entire they don't put the entire quran in front of you right you just pick verses and chapters that you're supposed to read and even when you're reciting the whole quran nobody's paying attention to what they're reading right everybody's just reciting it um like when okay so i became uh, an atheist not because of the quran or the hadith or anything i just left because i couldn't find any evidence for god right uh but the other ex-muslims they seem to be more like seeing something that they were like, what the hell? What kind of teaching this is in the cor in the Quran? Mm -hmm. And they like they were so when they saw it, they were so disgusted by it that they left it. So we had different reasons for why people leave. But even when I was an atheist, people like when when I joined these online secret communities, sometimes they would put a verse of the Quran, and they I would be like, no, that's not in the Quran. I mean, come on. I, we've been studying Islam for 12 years. Mm. There's no way that's in the Quran. And then I will pick up a Quran next to me and I open it. And I'm like, holy hell, that's in the Quran. And I'm like, Do we, how could we not know this is in the Quran? Like I was like, did, did other people, do other people know this is in the Quran? Because nobody would stay a Muslim if they knew this is in the Quran. Like I, I told my parents, did you guys know this is in the, in the Quran? And like they couldn't believe that. I mean, it's interesting because, see, we had a Quran, everybody, almost everybody I know, other than my uncle, which is very anti-Islamic, has a Quran in their house, right? Um, yeah, I got, and, like, I got like 20. Right, right. Yeah. But no, I'm just, like in Iran, right? Mm -hmm. Like people, but, but they don't read it. What you do with it is like you put it out for decoration, you bring it out in New Year's, uh, you kiss it before for good luck before going to first, on the first day of school, you hover it around your head for good luck before you travel, but nobody reads that thing, um, and even if you're, if the people that are religious, they're reading it, they're reciting it. Like they are really not paying attention. Like first of all, the language, the, the, most Muslims don't speak Arabic, right? Uh, only twenty percent of Muslims are Arab, um, and even that twenty percent that are Arab, they don't. A lot of them don't know classical Arabic, mm -hmm. right? Um, I mean, I know a lot of people that have memorized the entire Quran. I have no idea what they have memorized. Like they just could, like if you tell them chapter four, verse twenty-four, they will just 
say repeat the Arabic word by word, and like, okay, what does that mean? Like, that, that, that's know. that's a bad one, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. Check that one out. <laughs> right. Yeah. <clears throat> That's actually that's the worst one, which is mm-hmm. interesting to me that a lot of people mention the wife beating verse mm-hmm. for how anti woman Islam is, but this one is actually worse. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, but anyways. Um yeah, so um okay, so by the way, one thing is interesting because when I became religious, I tried to get my parents to become observant Muslims. And they were very annoyed with me. Like, they imagine going through your entire life after the Islamic Revolution of Iran, mm. complaining about how religious the government is and how the rules are all religious. Your mom always complaining about the hijab every day, mm. in, especially during summer. And all of a sudden, your kid is a religious, <laughs> like mm. a religious police in your own house. Yeah. And you're telling your your dad when every time he was drinking beer, telling you to like stop drinking alcohol. Or telling them to fast during Ramadan, or to try to pray with them, and you know they they were so annoyed with me that when I told them that I'm an atheist, their first reaction was "Oh, thank God," <laughs> which is very kind of. By the way, another interesting thing about my mom, my mom is not religious, but she still prayed when she needed God's help or anything like that. Like they were, I think, like you know, they just become. They have their own superstitions without actually being very Islamic. But when I started Atheist Republic, uh, I remember my mom actually praying to God for Atheist Republic to become successful. And I told my mom that, you know, what are you doing? Mom? This doesn't make any sense. You're, you're, you're asking God to, to support me in my war against God. And she's like, no, you don't understand. I'm a mom. A mom has to do what the mom has to do, like whatever support they could get. But eventually my mom also became an atheist. Mm-hmm. Both my brothers became atheists because of me. My mom became an atheist. Um, so, yeah. Hmm. That, that story uh, that story about your mom uh, still supporting you because you're her son, That that when you said it, that reminded me of a... Uh, of Nabil, he was going out to after he become a Christian, left Islam, become a Christian. He was going to speak at a church, and his mom was still, "Please don't go speak at the church. Please, you're you're, you're embarrassing us. You're embarrassing your family, and so on." He's like, "No, I'm going," and she's like, "All right, well, here's some money. At least get a haircut." <laughs> so, so she wanted she wanted him to look good. She wanted him to look Wait, good. Embarrassed, uh, embarrassed because of what? Because they're Muslim? <clears throat> uh, yeah, it was um. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it's, 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 it's almost, I mean, I, and I was, I was watching this, but it was almost like for them, it was almost like you must be bad parents if you raised someone who, who left Islam. You must have raised, because they, they, Muslims can, can almost never acknowledge that someone actually looked at the evidence and found reasons to reject Islam. So they have to blame it on something else. That's why they have to say, oh, it was, you left Islam for a girl, or you left Islam because you were getting paid by Jews, or you, you left Islam right. because of this or that. It can't be because, you know, I just, I looked, I, I examined the, the evidence that you said supports Islam, and it just doesn't support it. But I found all these reasons that, that go against what you said, and so I'm rejecting it, and they just can't acknowledge it. You have to be crazy, or brainwashed, or something else. Right. Or, or you nev- you were never a Muslim to begin with. That's mm-hmm. the number one I hear. Uh, especially mm-hmm. if you're a Shia, the Sunnis will say that. They, the Sunnis' number one argument against me is like, Armin, how could you be an ex-Muslim? You were a Shia. You were never a Muslim to begin with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here's a here's a here's a comment right here from the Don, who is a Muslim, as far as I recall. Um, this was a comment he posted earlier when you were talking about uh, being worried about hell. And the Don says, why are you so worried about hell? Be good, and you'll get to heaven. What's hard to understand? Now, uh, I'm going to go ahead and offer a quick response, and then you can respond as well. But uh, the Don, it, it's not that easy, my friend, and you might want to actually read your sources, your Islamic sources, on what it says. Uh, let me give you an example. Surah 46, verse 9 of the Quran. This is Muhammad. Muhammad is commanded to say, I am only a messenger and I do not know what Allah will do with you or with me. Right? Now you might say, oh well that can mean all kinds of things. No. If you go to Sahih al-Bukhari where it talks about it talks about this same thing, um, you find out this is in reference to salvation. A, a One of the best Muslims died and a woman said, oh you, great you're in paradise now. Muhammad said, what? You don't know that. And she said, "Well, if he's not in paradise, who can, you know who can be?" And Muhammad said, "I don't know what will I don't know what Allah will do with him or with me, right?" So 
you just don't know. You just don't know, right? You don't know if uh, if you've see if you're a, a, a secret mushrik, right? Not a not even a deliberate mushrik. You've just been you've you've had you you've been an idolater your entire life. You've been idolizing something all your life and not even realizing. You don't know what Allah is going to do to you, man. You don't know what Allah is going to punish you for. So if and the point here is, if Muhammad himself, if Muhammad himself said, I don't know what Allah is going to do with me. What hope do you have as a Muslim as far as guaranteeing your assurance of salvation? You don't have a lot. So anyway, for you to sit here and say, oh, just do good and you know you'll be fine. You don't yeah. know you'll be fine. Now, Muhammad didn't. Abu Bakr, the first of the rightly guided caliphs, he didn't. Uh, Abu Bakr said, if I had one foot in paradise, I would still fear Allah's deception. So these guys didn't have a lot of confidence. Confidence. They didn't have a lot of assurance, but you act like you do. So this isn't Islam, my friend. Yeah, I mean, Muslims always say only God knows, so you yep. can never claim, yeah, only God knows. But I, I want to uh, respond to some of the comments I see in the live chat. Is that, may oh, I you, you, Yeah, yeah, okay. so, so uh, um, wait, did we sort of, is there anything else you want to cover as far as your story before you go on? Because other than that, you can just, you can just uh, respond to questions. Well, I mean, everybody that talks about Islam, uh, you have to understand there's, there's as many Islams out there apparently as there are Muslims. Because every Muslim talks to you as if like they are, they have the full authority over what Islam. Not every Muslim. That's not fair. Most of them say, "Oh, I don't know. I'm not a scholar." So I'll take that back. But any Muslim that says like, "Oh, this is what you do," but you're talking about this is how it is, and like I could, sh I could bring up a whole, you know, thousands of other Muslims that completely disagree with you. And for you to talk with that amount of confidence about uh, Islam is surprising to me. Mm -hmm. Because when you, uh, because it's very interesting because when you criticize it, um, then say, no, you don't understand. And then when you ask them for, and then when you uh, try to get an understanding, well, okay, well, tell me how to understand this. But then there's so much diversity in the, how they view every single verse and every single tafsir and every single hadith. Well, I mean, if you can't even have a united understanding, you know, have a unity over what the Quran means or what the hadith means, uh, then what? I mean, who are you to tell me what's right and what's wrong, right? Maybe my interpretation is right and yours is wrong. I mean, it doesn't seem to be... Um, the, the best you can say about the Quran and the Hadith is that it doesn't seem to be written in a very efficient or effective way for people to be able to be, get a consistent message out of it. Mm. I mean, the most... the I mean, I say, to be fair again, I say that about the Bible as well. I know your audience doesn't agree. Uh, but I say that, you know, if you get so many different... Um, divi you know, interpretations and understanding for coming from uh, the same book, then it was really poorly written. I think at least you could say that. But I want to mention something about the people that I'm saying in the live chat. Outlaw is law, and another comment was that they mentioned Muslims will always blame things on others. Uh, I want to criticize these views a little bit because, first of all, you cannot, you shouldn't outlaw any views. If you want to fight Islam, that's the most inefficient way of fighting it. In fact, um, Islam grows faster under oppression. Okay, even if you don't care about, I mean, even if it didn't, I think most most of us here are for free speech and freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. Fighting Islam requires you to talk to Muslims, to befriend Muslims, right? Just like fighting atheism. The best way to fight atheism is to befriend atheists, right? Outlying Islam is not going to achieve you any, anything, and even if it did, you should be against it from a free speech uh, mm. perspective, right? And the, the person that says Muslim will always blame thing on, things on others. When you say Muslim will, Muslims will always, whatever you come comes after that is probably wrong unless mm -hmm. you say the only the only thing two things that i think you could say muslim will always uh, is muslims will always say that they believe in allah and muslims will always say muhammad is the last prophet and muslim will always say that the quran is a word of god other than those three things i don't think anything after that would be justified muslim will always there's nothing else that you could say after that that is logical um you know i i when we criticize Islam, when we fight Islam, we're not really against Muslims. In fact, we are against Islam mostly because of what Islam does to Muslims, right? We care for Muslims, 
you know, we are the same way that one is against cancer, but not against the cancer patient. We're, we're against Islam, but not against Muslims. In fact, Muslims are the number one victims of Islam. So, you know, I mean, you could say that in their perspective about atheism, right? So the way I talk to Muslims, and again, and Christianity, right? But the way I try to get Muslims to understand, because for Muslims, Islam is so much part of their identity that they can't separate this. When you go after Islam, they feel personally attacked. So for me to try to make them put their guard down and understand that um, why our attack on Islam is not a personal attack on them, is that imagine, I tell Muslims and Christians, that imagine if you wanted to attack atheism. And the reason why you're attacking atheism, like a Muslim, for example, is not because you hate atheists. You are concerned for atheists. You're concerned, for example, that I'm going to go to hell if I don't become a Muslim. Uh, and you're doing that because you care for me, you, you love your fellow human beings, and you don't want them to suffer. So your attack on atheism in that scenario is not an attack on atheists. In fact, your attack on atheism in that scenario is because of your care for atheists. So then I tell the Muslim, see how somebody could attack atheism? but not atheists, and they get that example. So, and then I said, so, so from our perspective, when we attack Islam or when we attack Christianity, is that, that's not an attack on Muslims. That's not an attack on Christians. That's just a disagreement with their idea. And we, we might be wrong, right? I tell the Muslim or the Christian, like, listen, we could, we could be completely wrong. You could be the right one. And we have, maybe we completely missed the point. We are, you know, we looked into it and we come up with the wrong conclusion. You may, you might be right, but if you want to address that, at least understand the intention, because the intention is not to personally be against you. Even if we're going against Islam, even we, if we want Islam to die, if we want to defeat Islam, we want to completely wipe it off the map. And I say that we do. We want Islam to die. Islam mm. needs to die. Religion needs to die. But even as aggressive as that sounds. That's not a personal attack on you. And if, if the attack on atheism makes sense, that how is that not a personal attack, then you would, this should also make sense to you. You have to see that the intention, even if you think the, the logic of it is not sound, the intention of it is not a personal attack on you. And that, you, that example usually works for me, and they get, they, it brings their guard down. And then you could actually have a d discussion. I, say, I tell them, like, listen, if, you're at, if you want to completely destroy atheism, completely end atheism because of your concern for atheists, I as an atheist appreciate your sympathy. Even if I think that's, if you, the Islam that you believe in is completely ridiculous, is complete, is barbaric, and you as, um, got it completely wrong, I appreciate the, your kindness, right? And, and the, the generalization that people make, again, if you want to defeat Islam, befriend Muslims. That's the best way to defeat Islam is to befriend. If you want to defeat atheism, befriend atheism, befriend atheists, because you cannot change people's opinions unless you could talk to them and they listen to you. And you can't, people will not listen to you if you're attacking them personally. The most efficient way of attacking an idea is to befriend the people that believe it, right? And this is why I think our attack on Islam is not only, it sounds very harsh because it's an attack on Islam, but because it requires befriending Muslims, it's actually is the complete opposite, right? And so don't, don't generalize Muslims like that because, yeah, Islam is barbaric, Islam is anti-human, Islam is anti-woman, Islam is anti-science, Islam is anti all human, humanist values that we hold dear. Um, again, uh, in my view, so is Christianity, but I know your audience doesn't agree with that. We'll get, to that, it, we'll get to that on Sunday. Yeah, I just want to always make that clear because a lot of people uh, might think like, okay, but Islam is all of that, but Muslims are not. Just like I said, when I was in Iran, in Iran I didn't know any Muslim that knew the verses in the Quran that we talk, that you criticize, that I criticize, mm -hmm. right? 
even when I became an ex-Muslim, I still didn't know about those verses. I learned about those verses after I left Islam, right? So, most Muslims are better than Islam. Yep. Right? Yeah. Mo they're better people. In fact... They're better than their prophet. They're better than their prophet. Mm -hmm. They're better than their Quran. You see, when a Muslim, like the wife-beating verse, right? When, mm -hmm. a when you tell that this verse says that you, you should be beat your wife if you fear disobedience, right? Mm -hmm. And when Muslims, so many Muslims, when you bring them this to their attention, either they're very uncomfortable about it or they're not, they ignore it. Or they try to come up with an excuse that why this means something else, right? Mm -hmm. And they try and they fail yep. because it clearly means you should beat your wife. But even though they're failing, even though it's ridiculous that they try to make this verse mean something else, the fact that they're trying to me sh shows that they're uncomfortable about this mm -hmm. verse. They don't want this verse to be there. They want this verse to mm -hmm. mean something else because most Muslims don't want to beat their wife. Mm -hmm. Most Muslims don't want slavery. Most Muslims don't want to take capture women in wars like the Quran allows you to. Most <laughs> even uh, even on the uh, even on the the wife beating beating issue, the most common response I hear even before they start trying to argue that it you know it just means tap them with a toothbrush or or uh, brush some grass up against them or something like this. Even before they get to that, the most common response I get is, "What are you talking about? I never beat my husband. Never beat me. Or you know, I never beat right. you know, I never beat my wife and stuff." So, and that just goes down to, <clears throat> "Great, you're you're living a better life than than your than your prophet called you to." Right, <clears throat> exactly. <clears throat> but some people might criticize then, like, <clears throat> "Oh, then if you don't follow the Quran and the Hadith, then you're not a you're not a true Muslim." That's not, that's not correct because you don't like. The, the definition of a Muslim is not somebody that follows every single Islamic law. As long as you believe in God and Muhammad as his last prophet and the Quran as the direct word of God, you're a Muslim. But you might say like, okay, but how could you believe in that the Quran is direct word of God and not even read it and not even follow it? Well, yeah, I, I have the same question. But the fact is that so many people think that the Quran is direct word of God and never bother to read it or understand it anyways. That's just a fact, okay? Technically, they're a Muslim. The fact that they don't follow the rules or don't even know the rules does not make them a non-Muslim. It just makes them a very bad Muslim, right? And most Muslims are just nominal Muslims. They don't follow the rules. They don't even know the rules. They don't care about the rules. Most Muslims are, their minds is not even consumed with Islam. Most Muslims are thinking about, you know, whether the couches that they just bought matches the curtains. Why did their son got the, such a low grade in school? Can they afford this car or they should sell it? These are the things that occupies people, Muslims' mind. They don't go around and think, am I living my life according to Hadith and mm -hmm. to the Quran? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, w I wanted to get to a, a comment that's about to destroy you. <clears throat> I did want to say uh, I, I agree with, with, a, with a ton of, of what you said about banning Islam. Um, there are countries that, that ban certain books, like there are certain countries in Europe that have banned uh, Hitler's Mein Kampf and so mm -hmm. on. And uh, just, you know, I, I live in the United States, even that's weird. You can walk into Barnes and Noble right now and get a and get a copy of Hitler's Mein Kampf. The, the, the reason it's weird, I mean, how, how would you refute it? How would you refute? How would you refute the claims in the book if you can't get the book to 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 use it to refute them? So it's very weird uh, from an American perspective to be uh, banning books or banning ideas and so on. Right. Um, so so agree with you completely on that. And and also also your point about distinguishing between the ideology that you're refuting and the people who happen to adhere to that ideology. Because mm -hmm. b long before, long before anyone had ever heard of, of David Wood, I'd had several good Muslim friends, um, and we argued all the time, uh, sometimes yelling, but it never crossed our minds even once that, oh, because he's criticizing my views about Jesus, he must therefore hate me and want me to die. And it never crossed... Uh, their minds that because mm -hmm. I'm arguing against Muhammad and against the Quran, um, that therefore it, it must be because I hate them. We always understood that we have each other's best interest at mm -hmm. heart, and that's what we're after. And that should be the case. That should be the case uh, between uh, atheists, Christians, Muslims, and so on. Not necessarily according to uh, you know the ideology of Islam, where you know the motives should be different. But as far as human beings, if you if you are if you have a genuine interest in the well-being of other people, 
um, and you are convinced that they are following a, a false path or a dangerous path or something that's ruining their lives, um, you should, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you uh, try to help them, right? I mean, when I, when I look at jihadis who go and blow themselves up, somehow these guys became convinced that the best, the greatest thing they can do for their God is to go blow people up in the name of their God. And my goodness, if you ever had the slightest bit of concern for these guys as they were on that path, why would you not blast that ideology uh, to shreds? Right. Yep. Uh, to to uh, One thing I want to add, when you mentioned about people, um, you know, suicide bombers and stuff like that, I do think that the cost of religion and Islam is a lot more than suicide attacks and you know war like because okay when people when atheists think about oh religion harms you know poisons everything the first, the things that comes to their minds is like suicide bombers um you know child molesting priests and war uh, but i i always mention that you know this is religion the the cost of islam for example uh in in our lives is a lot more subtle and less newsworthy and more, way more costly than than terrorist attacks. Um, I mean, even if you just want to focus on terrorist attacks, uh, a lot of people just think about Western terrorist attacks. The number of terrorist attacks in, I don't know, Iraq or other Syria and stuff like that, they don't count that in, they don't put that into account, which is astronomically higher. Mm. But even, like, I mean, if you if your ideology is not close to reality every single decision that you're making is has a cost to it right um, imagine every single you know moment that you could have been with your children instead of spending it in a mosque or studying the quran or if you went to disneyland with your kids instead of karbala <laughs> uh, or if you if uh, this politician's didn't make that small little decision because he thought this is a more Islamic that influenced a million people's lives at, at, you know, at the same time, just the cost of the economy because of this small decision that was more a little bit more Islamic. And these, you know, these things are not newsworthy. And, you know, imagine the people that you're not with because of Islam. Imagine the families that were separated. Imagine the people that are not... Uh, with the with the person that they love, I mean all these um, all these small little miseries here and there, all the economical costs, all the cost to science, all the cost to progress, <clears throat> all of this. If you just add them all together, I think it's a if it's a lot more than suicide bombing and other stuff. Those are obviously tragedies, but I just think that the ongoing cost of all of that is just a lot more. And less newsworthy, but if you add it together, I think, you know, just think about like, uh, you know, in Turkey, right? Uh, when they just, you know, wanted to outlaw interests and in banks and, you know, the, the cost of the economy there, it was huge. Nobody thinks about that when, when, you know, when they're thinking about the cost of Islam, they just think about suicide bombers, which is, you know, very yeah, anyways, mm -hmm. I don't want to get into statistics, but I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Now, how are you going to respond to this decisive refutation? Um, he writes, Armin Navabi was never a Muslim to begin with. Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. And no matter how many of you fake ex-Muslims try to cause harm to Islam, Allah will be victorious. And this comes from mm -hmm. the apostate prophet. Oh. <laughs> oh, he's in the live chat? Yeah, he's a classic troll. <laughs> That's great. Oh my god, I had an answer prepared. But no, I think I'm defeated. <laughs> I, saw you I, start, have... I saw you start to jot notes down because there were, so, there were, there were different parts to it. <laughs> right. No, but there's no way I can recover from that. I'm sorry, I'm defeated. I, I'll... <laughs> yeah. No, he cracks me up because, I mean, he could have put any other name uh, other than apostate prophet on there, and it would sound exactly like yeah. a lot of the comments I see uh, every day from from yeah, devout Muslims. Was, yeah. By the way, he, I I love love his channel, and um, I think the the disagreement. I mean, if you look at the the discussion I had with the apostate prophet, if you look at the comment mm -hmm. section, a lot of people try to make it personal. Uh, if when you know a lot of atheists on my side were the anti-Christian. 
uh, they tell me that, oh, Armin, you're, you, when you talked to a post, a post <clears throat> prophet, he was ridiculous. He was being an idiot. You made all the right points. Or if you look at all the Christians supporting the apostate prophet, they try to make it personal. Like, oh, Armin doesn't understand Christianity. He's an idiot. I'm not impressed. I love apostate prophet. He's the, you know, he's the ex-Muslim I want to support. But if you look at my conversation that I had with him, it's not, it doesn't get, you know, it's just a disag friendly disagreements, right? A lot of, uh, a lot of the audience always try to get it, make it personal and try to make your disagreements become something more than disagreement. They, joke, they go, instead of tackling your ideas and telling you why wrong, they just want to attack the character of the person that they uh, disagree with, right? Or they just want to go after them personally. Um, and I just help, you know, content creators, don't, don't let people, don't let your fan base drag you into that. Like, no matter how many people come to me and say, like, Armin, a true atheist is an atheist that attacks all religions equally. So, apostate prophet is an idiot. He's only focusing on Islam. Uh, I support you, not him. I'm like, did you even look at the discussion that we had? Did you see how friendly we were? Like, you, the whole point of the discussion was not to convince each other to the other side. The whole point of the discussion was to show that we could have a disagreement and be friends to, to be, to show other people that, you know, your disagreements doesn't have to ruin your friendship. Disagreements are fun among friends. That's, that's a, you know, you know, this is why I enjoy talking to people that I disagree with rather than just, mm -hmm. you know, just nodding and agreeing on every single issue that we bring up. But that's boring. This is, this is why I love talking to that person preface because we know what we disagree on and we could have a friendly mm -hmm. conversation about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I, I went through graduate school in philosophy, and pretty much everything you say is going to be attacked, right? In, 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 the, in the world right. of philosophy, everything you say, and it's considered, hey, that's part of how you get to the truth, right? Um, Descartes, when he wrote the Meditations, he sent out a series of letters with copies of the med Meditations. Hey, tell me, to, to some of the greatest minds of his time, he sent them out, hey, tell me how you would refute this. Go ahead, look, look for any weaknesses in my arguments here. So right. guys, if we have uh, we have very different worldviews on a variety of topics, um, don't don't get too upset if, if someone points right. out, hey, this is the, I see a problem. I see a problem in your your worldview, and I'm going to right. raise this as an objection to to your position. It shouldn't be, ah, you're killing me. You're killing me with that. You must hate me and stuff like that. No, come on, you, you no. Try, try see if you can respond to it. Right? Yeah, I mean, no, you can never change someone's like. Obviously, we are all wrong about something. Okay, none of us here is God, right? So we're we're wrong about something, and we we're hoping that somebody corrects us about mm -hmm. what we are wrong about, right? Like, mm -hmm. and the more conversations we have with people we disagree with, like, get out of your bubble. Don't listen to people you agree with all the time. See what other people have to say. And if you want to tell them why they're wrong, do something other than like, oh, you're wrong. What? Well, that's ridiculous. Well, okay, how's that going to convince anybody? Like, mm -hmm. okay, uh, that's it? Like, can you tell me why I'm wrong? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, like you, and, and also, Get, if you want people to listen to you and convince them, maybe uh, start without a personal attack. Because, I mean, I, I don't care about personal attacks, but other people, uh, if you want them to actually pay attention to why, for, for example, a lot of people in your audience, they want to tell people like, oh, Jesus. Like they come they come in the comment section on Atheist Republic and they say, I love Jesus and Jesus is Lord and you wouldn't, atheists will never convince me otherwise. I'm like, okay. What am I? What am I supposed to do with that information? Like, like what is like what is that going to achieve? Okay, mm -hmm. so I love you. Say I love Jesus. Like, am I supposed to like be convinced by that or change my opinion? Like, I don't understand. Like, or like, oh, you atheist. Atheism is ridiculous. Atheism is another religion. Atheism is this and that. All right. Okay, but. Are, is there a follow-up to this? Like, can you tell why exactly? Or is are you just going to come make a claim and that's it? Like, th these kind of activism on... And to be fair, we have that on our side as well, right? Like, when atheists talk to Muslims or Christians, like, oh, you, you just have fairy tales. Oh, you guys have, don't believe in anything based on evidence. You just have faith and no logic on your side. Like, okay, but that's not really going to change anyone's opinion. If you just want to make people upset and just, like, that's you know, mission accomplished, right? Mm -hmm. But if you want to actually change opinions um, or try at least to change opinions, that's also not going to, you know, that's, you know, then what's the point of even leaving, talking to other people 
if you're not trying to change their opinion? Are you just trying to win? Are you just trying to signal to your side that you're a warrior for mm. your cause? I, then actually trying to convince people on, on the other side that you know, like if we are, if 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 people are trying to convince people to become Christian, Muslim, or leave religion altogether, uh, I'm pretty sure they would be more more friendly with each other because, mm -hmm. and given that they're not, I think their motives may be something else. Their motive is just to signal to themselves that they're being virtuous or they're doing their they're on God's side or on their logic side. But I think people would be a lot more civil if their actual intention. Mm -hmm was uh, to convince people. Here's a, uh, this is along a related line. <clears throat> this is from, uh, <clears throat> losing my voice again, <clears throat> Abdul Rahman says, without Islam, I would feel less purpose and have doubts. I have happiness because I am Muslim. It has kept me firm, respect parents, forgive the wrongdoers, increase in good deeds without a return. Um, and uh, I'll go ahead and read that again, uh, just so uh, just so Armin here can hear. Uh, I'll just point out, Abdul Rahman, uh, anyone can say the exact same thing, right? R regardless of their position, anyone could say. So a Mormon can say, without Mormonism, I would feel less purpose and have doubts. I have happiness because I am a Mormon. It has kept me firm, respect for my parents, res uh, forgive the wrongdoers, increase in good deeds without a return. So this really has nothing to do with whether Islam is true or not. It's just, hey, you, you've got a worldview that gives you some sort of, uh, some sort of positions. Right. And also a lot of people do that without any religion at all. A lot of people have hope and purpose and <laughs> remain moral people without any religion. And I'm hoping, who was this guy? He says Abdul Rahman, was mm -hmm. that his name? Yeah. And I and I'm and I'm gonna say Abdul Abdul Rahman. I'm I'm hoping that you don't need Islam to do all of that because I'm hoping that you're a good enough human being that if Islam was taken away from you like through reasoning and through conversation, you will still be a good person. Um, if you need Islam to be to do all of that, which I don't think you do, that's that's really, you know, I mean, for example, a lot of people say like, oh, I mean, then why, why would people do good things and, you know, be moral and be respecting their parents or do this or do that if they didn't have Islam or Christianity? I'm like, wait, so are you telling me that you're doing this only because of your religion? Are you doing this only because of God? Like, you're not enough. You're not good enough human being to realize that this is just a good thing to do. Like if. If it wasn't for make, you know, gaining points with Allah, you would stop doing these good things. Like that's not a really good way of being moral. I mean, you're not really being moral if you're doing that. You're just following commandments, you know, following God's laws. If you're, uh, you know, obeying laws, if 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 that's your source of morality, if it's not coming from your own sense of sympathy, from your own sense of care for your fellow human beings. And I'm pretty sure it is. I mean, I think that m Muslims and Christians, I think highly of majority of people. So I think most Muslims and Christians will remain good people without their religion. Um, this is actually, <clears throat> this is actually, I think, one of the most important uh, topics for discussion between um, not just atheists and Christians, but atheists and uh on the other side, Christians, Muslims, <clears throat> anyone who believes that you need a, a sort of transcendent standard for morality. Um, okay. So uh, hoping we can focus on that a bit uh, on, on Sunday okay. or even have a totally separate discussion because, um, yeah, that's a that's a huge issue. And, and just so you know, the, the, the idea, the idea is if you say. Because, you know, atheists are totally right. If I say, hey, you know, I believe in, in, in Jesus, that's why I believe in um, in loving other people. You could say, well, you can love other people without without believing in, in Jesus. You right. know, what's the point? Um, but the, the, the idea here is if we are, if this is, you know, if this universe is, is matter in motion and here's this giant universe and Earth is this little tiny speck and we're these little blobs of cells. And that's how somehow in there, in the course of evolution, whether a biological evolution or societies evolving, <coughs> we come to certain moral conclusions. The idea is what's the status of those moral conclusions, those moral claims that we make that, you know, you, you, should, you should love other people or do everything you can to, to help other people. Is that, are we just wired to do that? 
And if so, you, you shouldn't always do what you're wired to do, right? I mean, you you know, some people are wired to be violent. It doesn't mean you should be violent. So is it just yep. how we're wired or is it something that our society just happens to teach? And if, if so, I mean, you know, there are places in the world where if your sister walks down the street and shows her ankles, then you have to beat her to death. Um, so you can't just say, well, society teaches it. And so, uh, getting, getting to the bottom of that is, is I think one of the most, one of the most important, uh, topics of, of discussion that we could ever have. Right. I mean, yeah, you are <coughs> wired to do that, but you, um, you shouldn't just follow it because you're wired that to do that, but you're lucky that we're wired to do, uh, to do, to be like that, but we should, you know, I mean, we're wired to be good in certain ways and we're also wired to be evil in certain ways, but the good ones. <coughs> The, the way we decide which ones are the good ones is that we follow the ones that are beneficial. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, we are also wi wired in a way to want to, um, you know, capture and, you know, we, it used to be normal for armies to capture an entire city and rape every single woman. That was uh, how the human animal is, behaves, apparently, in, mm -hmm. without st standards in society. So we are wired in really dark ways as well, but... Um, we decide which ones are beneficial to a society to follow and which ones are not. But yeah, we are we do have a desire for sympathy. We do have also a desire for kindness. It is naturally coded within us. By the way, I have an entire chapter in this in my book, Why There's No God. If oh, cool. Hey, it. hey. Uh, we obviously don't want to uh, just be talking to each other for uh, all future events, but... Um, that is such an important topic. So how about you know how about we we wrap up here shortly because my voice is really giving out more than I can uh, than right. I can explain. I'm going to give you one more question here because it'll be a good way to a uh, good way to wrap up. Uh, but then on Sunday we can go ahead with the discussion we are planning on having, just sort of general um, right. uh, atheism, uh, Christianity, and Islam. But then on a separate on a separate issue, I'll go ahead and read read your chapter on this in your book, and then we can okay. have a, we can have a we can have a discussion about that because that, that would be I think that would be helpful to a, to a lot of people. Right, that's, that's good. All good. Okay. All right, yeah, sounds perfect. good. All right, and here I'm going to go ahead and let you wrap up with this, and some people are going to get mad at me for not responding, but <laughs> Ellie, Ellie says, why should a person become an atheist? And for everyone who's going to flip out and say, David, you're not responding to him. Keep in mind, this is an interview. We're trying to get his views. And just so you know, I normally start, this is normally how I do things in a first conversation. I normally just spend the time asking people questions, uh, right. getting their views on a variety of topics. And then in the future, I start responding to them and so on. So uh, yet we will, we will be getting to our disagreements over this, an the answers on questions like this. On Sunday on his channel again if you're just tuning in now the link is in the description box to Armin's channel uh, but right now we'll go ahead and uh, make this the last question why should a person become an atheist don't hold back well actually I don't have to. there's only one line because there's no evidence for the existence of God that's all you need to know that's the only answer but if you want a more detailed answer there you can buy my book why there's no God mm -hmm. uh, but I mean you don't have to buy it if you can't afford it just email me I'll send you a free PDF version mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah but I mean there is no it's just simple as that there is no evidence for the existence of God and that's why we don't believe it and you don't it's not should in there like we don't think like you don't have to become an atheist we're suggesting to you for you to consider it, just like when people come and tell us that, hey, here's Christianity. They're not, they're not telling us <laughs> we should become a Christian. It's just an invitation. And I think that it's good for all of us. Like Muslims should also be able to, you know, so a lot of people are like, oh, why are atheists preaching atheism? Now they're just like a religion. And like, we're not against religion because they're preaching it. They should be able to preach it. We're, we're against religions because they don't have any evidence for their claims. And, and we could be wrong. We could be wrong, okay? Oh, oh you're wrong. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know. Just, <laughs> <laughs> no, we could be wrong. If we're wrong, come correct us. I mean, I'm hoping that if we're wrong, somebody could correct me before I die, right? So mm -hmm. please, if, if, if we are wrong and you're right, <clears throat> come and talk to us. But the point is, the, the point, we don't have a problem with Christianity and Islam that they're preaching if that's their views and they should be able to promote it. The problem that we have is that we don't get to promote it. We don't get to provide an alternative to people. Every time we want to promote, uh, come and provide an alternative to Christianity, to Islam, to Judaism, to Hinduism, people are like, oh, you're becoming a, just like a religion. I'm like, no, we think this is the version of reality. We want as many people as possible to know that this alternative exists, that this is an option, right, that they could, uh, that they could consider it. 
and um, and it's a, it's a mere invitation. Uh, we're not forcing anybody to come listen to our arguments. We're not forcing anybody to buy our books, to follow our pages, to follow our YouTube channels, to come to our meetups. It's just a mere invitation. People that are curious show up. A lot of people leave Islam, become atheists. A lot of people leave Christianity. There's other, a lot of people go from atheism to Christianity or to Islam. People change their minds, and I think everybody should be able to tell people why they think that their version is correct, and people could see. And I think a lot of people tell me, like, Armin, you should let people believe whatever they want. Who are you to tell them uh, that atheism is right? And, like... First of all, let them believe. Am I putting a gun on people's head and telling them to buy my book and read it? What do you mean, let them believe? Like, it's just an invitation. And second of all, if you really want to let people believe what they want, then you have to give them all the options. If somebody was born a Christian and they only saw Christianity as an option and everything else they heard was just Christian's version of Islam, Christians explaining to them how atheism is ridiculous. Christians is explaining to them how Hinduism is ridiculous. And not actually looking at the options and let, hearing from the people that are promoting it why that's the correct option. Then you are the people that are not let, letting people believe what they want. Because to truly let people believe what they want is to provide them with all the options. And we are just doing that. We're showing them an alternative way to think about the world other than Christianity, Islam and all the other religions. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Armin. And uh, as Draper 2011 here asks, what time on Sunday? If I recall, that's 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. Same time. On, as yeah, and that is the Atheist Republic channel. The link's in the description box. That That's all correct? <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Okay. Um, yeah. so, so, sorry, you ask if the link is in the... What did you ask? No, no, uh, I, I just said all that's correct, right? Atheist Republic yeah. channel, Sunday... Yeah. 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. Right. And so, say, so, so, yeah, yeah, guys, same time same time as this uh, was, but uh, on Sunday. All right. So five, so, five, 5 p.m. Pacific. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thanks again to Armin Navabi, uh, atheist, ex-Muslim, uh, founder of the Atheist Republic, author of Why There Is No God. And he joined us here to explain why he left Islam, give us some background on his story, and we'll have more on his channel this coming Sunday. Hope you'll all join us there. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yep. All right.